Beautiful. Yes. All right. So, uh, uh, well, you've hopefully all heard by now that our denomination is headed for a major split and that there's a need for this that is widely agreed upon by leaders of all major factions. But why are we dividing? Uh, there's really um, three different parts of what I'm going to talk about. The big picture of how we got here, the specific nature of the present separation, and expected future direct, direct trajectories for the new emerging denominations and the choices our congregations and conferences are going to have to make. So you may have heard that the division is because of disagreements about the place of LGBT. Uh, be LGBTQ persons in the life of the church, and there is some truth to that, but it is really misleading to talk exclusively in those terms, because the reality is that this division has been a long time in coming, uh, and the coming split is really the result of a long history, which dates back long before the present debates we've had uh, most prominently uh, in the media and elsewhere over homosexuality. And um, so we have a long history, particularly of a breakdown of discipline and a breakdown of doctrine. So, and these two things really go to the heart beyond any more modern debates of what this split is all about. And I'll just say, by the way, if you ever hear any United Methodists uh, use language of saying that they are absolutely against ever splitting the church that's just not a serious idea, unless the person saying it is actually in the process of becoming Roman Catholic. Because when you think about it, any Protestant by definition believes that there are sometimes some issues worth splitting the church over. So I know I saw this in my confirmation class back in the day. Many of us have seen this famous drawing of the hardworking circuit riding preacher of early Methodism you know, just going through the very difficult circumstances in the rain, but going forth to preach the gospel. And it really dramatically highlights how when Methodism first began, we were really this high commitment movement that really demanded a lot of sacrifice and forsaking of worldly comforts for the sake of the gospel. And what really set us apart was the, the degree to which we practice sometimes rather demanding levels of church discipline for not just our leaders and clergy, but also for lay members. You can go back and read all kinds of accounts of and examples of it being a routine thing for lay people to face all kinds of temporary but serious consequences within the church for all kinds of sins ranging from getting drunk to wife beating. But over the course of the 19th century, we saw a decline in really expecting too much of our lay people or really thinking it was any of our business to even ask what lay, how lay people were doing in living Christian lives. And then in our ministers as well. This picture is of a book that appeared all the way back in 1846 that already back then was lamenting how Methodism had backslidden from its earlier holiness. Wow. Uh, we notably saw some early moral decline uh, in Methodism with the sins of slavery and racism and not just in the South. We started out with this really strong early commitment against the great evil of American slavery. John Wesley spoke strongly against it. He defended the equality of black people and he was a personal inspiration to that great British anti-slavery activist, William Wilberforce. The 1784 Christmas conference that established American Methodism as our own denomination declared that one of the very central goals of our new church was to quote, extirpate the abomination of slavery. Our early rules for Methodists were very clear that Methodists were forbidden from buying, selling or owning slaves. But then this strong principled Christian stand conflicted with their culture. If we insisted too much on this moral stance, which was rooted in scripture, there were fears that we would offend some people, that we would drive some people away, that we might especially offend some upper class people and lose a lot of money for our ministries. Any of this sound familiar? So then we started compromising on our rules against slave owning. We started looking the other way for Methodists involved in this sin. It, this sin became increasingly accepted in some regions of our denomination. Then in 1844, we had a newly elected bishop who was openly involved in this inherently sinful lifestyle of owning slaves. That was what finally sparked the last straw and total crisis that split our denomination apart for decades. 
And then later in the 19th through early 20th century, you had the holiness movement in America. This was largely a movement of believers who took some aspects of John Wesley's teachings about Christians avoiding all sin and really ran with it. And over time, Methodists involved in the holiness movement became increasingly marginalized in much of what became our denomination. And eventually, some of these holiness Methodist pastors were essentially driven out and became exiles in the new denomination, like a new, or sorry, in new denominations, like the Church of the Nazarene. And when they left, our denomination lost a lot of positive influences for disciplined, holy Christian living. So all this I'm talking about is back 100 years ago. Uh, so our decline in discipline has a long history. But what about our decline in doctrine? By 1813, evangelist and veteran General Conference delegate Leander Munhall of Philadelphia was sounding the alarm about how the Methodist Episcopal Church was infected by liberal theologies, how Methodists were becoming more worldly, and how powerful elites in our denominational bureaucracy were pushing, uh, were pushing Methodism away from our own biblical doctrines on core issues like original sin and the authority of scripture. And at the same time, you had the new theological movement of modernism that was widely attacking these and other core Christian teachings, particularly any supernatural parts of Christianity. Now, Munhall could be a bit strident and unnuanced and frustratingly vague, but in reading his 1913 book, Breakers, Methodism Adrift, it's really striking to see the similarities between his complaints and the complaints of many traditionalists United Methodists today. Here's what Brother Munhall lamented about our denomination back then. There was a great spiritual deadness throughout our churches. There was anti-biblical teaching that was heavily promoted by our seminaries, by our official denominational agencies, and by our own official denominational publishing house. In pulpit after pulpit of the churches of our denomination, preachers were no longer teaching their people about the core doctrines of human depravity and the judgment to come. And overall, our congregations are growing smaller, and many of the outsiders are having less and less respect for us. He talked about on the more liberal side that was more re-envisioning the faith to something different from the more biblical faith of the Wesley brothers, uh, Munhall placed a majority of the bishops, nearly all the other top denominational officials, in some more radicalized annual conferences, and on the more orthodox side that were carrying on the faith once delivered, Munhall placed other United States conferences, the majority of non-white American members, and then our annual conferences, most of them outside of the United States. He also noted a real problem, this is 107 years or 108 years ago, of bishops would use the same appointment power they have in our system today to, uh, were, uh, to elevate clergy who were more liberal in their theology and doctrine, so they would help the clergy be in churches where they'd have more influence and move up the ranks in our denominations, while many pastors were effectively persecuted in a way by being sent out to the equivalent of Timbuktu in their appointments where they could be marginalized and not have as much influence uh, if they were more evangelical biblically grounded pastors. Again, this was a complaint that was over 100 years ago. And uh, my friend Riley Case uh, notes that uh, by 1920, theological modernism basically controlled the institutional level of our denomination in both the North and the South, the colleges, the seminaries, the pastor schools, the courses of study, the church press, Sunday school materials, even the Council of Bishops either were or would soon be in the hands of modernists 101 years ago. And those trends kept continuing over the next decades. Fast forward to 1966. Reverend Charles Kieser of Illinois published an op-ed that sparked the Good News Movement. He wrote about a group within our, our Methodist churches who had little to no representation in our denominational bureaucracy he said, I speak of those Methodists who are variously called evangelicals or conservatives or fundamentalists. A more apt description is orthodox, for these brethren hold a traditional understanding of the Christian faith. 
And Kizor outlined five key beliefs of this group, which were really five of the most prominent doctrines that the modernists had been attacking since at least the early 20th century. They were the authority of scripture, number one. Number two, that Jesus really was miraculously born of a virgin, that that really did happen in history. Number three, that somehow Christ on the cross paid the price of transgression, which a righteous and holy God properly requires. Number four, that Jesus actually physically and miraculously rose from the dead. And that number five, whatever the details of the end times may turn out to be, there will come a day when Jesus Christ really will physically come back to earth. None of this should be remarkable for a Methodist to believe. I mean, it's all right there in the Methodist Articles of Religion, which is our core doctrine, has been our core doctrine to the beginning. We now have the EUB Confession of Faith added to. But what I find most striking about Kizor's article is its title. He called his title, his article is called Methodism Silent Minority. He was explicitly describing folk who believe in these most, most basic biblical Methodist doctrines as having become a marginalized minority within what's now our denomination. And that's quite a shift from how in 1913, Brother Munhall declared that the majority of our members and ministers were loyal to such biblical and Methodist doctrines. So over 50 years of modernist dominance had taken a toll. Then over time, uh, good news was joined by other renewal groups, all with similar perspectives and fighting for similar uh, causes, but uh, with different uh, personnel and different areas of focus. So in 1981, the same year I was born, was born the Institute on Religion and Democracy, IRD, and a specific United Methodist program uh, was launched in 1994. In 1987, LifeWatch was launched to focus on pro-life causes within our denomination. 1995, the confessing movement started to focus on theology and doctrine. In 2016, the Wesleyan Covenant Association started and is now leading the way towards preparing for a new conservative Methodist denomination. Uh, but meanwhile, the growing chasm of theological divide in our denomination continued. In the early 2000s, we had an active bishop of our denomination, Joseph Sprague, in my old stomping grounds of Chicago, who publicly denied such core Christian doctrines as the accuracy of the Gospel of John, as well as the virgin birth, substitutionary atonement, and physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was basically using the office of bishop to teach that people should not believe in some of the most core Christian doctrines. There was a formal complaint filed against him, but basically what happened in 2003 was that he was let off with a slap on the wrist. Then some of you may have heard of this active, this minister out west named Karen Olivito, and that is not a doctored photo. That is uh, from her something she sent out on her own Twitter feed uh, a while back. And in 2016, the Western jurisdiction, which is basically the Western third of the United States, of our denomination elected her as bishop, knowing that her being in an openly partnered lesbian relationship was an open defiance of our longstanding church laws saying that our clergy cannot be quote, self-avowed practicing homosexuals. That's the main thing she's known for. But there are much deeper doctrinal concerns with elevating her to the office of bishop. In 2005, I was in the room when she was speaking at a major national gathering of liberal United Methodists. Among other things, she urged addressing both the benefits and flaws of scriptures. Well, what do you mean by quote unquote flaws of scripture? Well, Olivito made clear that one flaw she saw in the Bible was the quote, theology of election and chosenness, unquote, which she right, rightly recognized is taught in the Bible. And then it got really bizarre when Olivito started teaching at this public event about the account in Acts 16 of Paul casting a demon out of a slave girl. According to Oliveto, getting to be free of the demon did nothing to make that girl's life better and probably made it worse. So now we have a bishop, a top leader of our denomination, who is on record as teaching about the flaws of scripture and the benefits of demon possession. About a year after she was elected bishop, she used the bishop's office in Denver to publicly teach that we should not, these are her exact words, create an idol out of Jesus Christ. But how can you possibly create an idol out of somebody who already is God? 
Well, according to Olivito, Jesus actually had such sins as his bigot, quote, his bigotries and prejudices, unquote, and that as an adult, he needed to experience, quote, conversion. There are multiple reasons why, according to our denomination's own official rules and standards, Olivito should be removed from the office of bishop. But the denominational leaders who have that responsibility have made clear they are unwilling to do so because they support her. And in fact, she was recently elevated even further to become the president of all the bishops in the Western jurisdiction. Which brings us to the nature of the current separation. Fundamentally, our breakdown of doctrine has led to a breakdown of discipline. And this has finally reached the breaking point. All of our ministers vow to uphold the United Methodist Book of Discipline. Among other things, our discipline officially teaches that all individuals, yes, really all, are of sacred worth. And that we do not hate our friends and family members and church members that are uh, through no uh, through no fault of their own, find themselves attracted to people of the same sex or are confused about their own uh, experience, some dysphoria or, or tension about their own gender identity. We urge compassion and love uh, for all people, including um, loved ones in the LGBTQ community. At the same time, we do teach the biblical standard that sexual relations are a gift only for monogamous heterosexual marriage. And so if somebody wants to be elevated to be set apart as a United Methodist minister, our standards are clear that they must abstain from uh, premarital sex, adultery, homosexual practice, pornography, or performing same-sex weddings. And there used to be a widespread sense with some exceptions that even if you disagreed with these standards of the discipline, if you were a bishop or a leader, you were not gonna let ministers just break these policies because you all vowed to uphold them. It's just a matter of basic integrity of keeping your word. Or if you were gonna undermine the spirit of the law, generally people would at least find a way to focus on some little technicality of loophole in the discipline so that they could at least have a small sliver of honesty in saying that they were following the letter of the law. But then in February, 2019 in St. Louis, uh, the specially called General Conference effectively reaffirmed these standards and also closed not all, but the majority of the main loopholes uh, to better ensure consistent enforcement of these and other standards for our clergy. And this added enforcement for laws we already had on the books was necessary because there was a growing trickle of clergy, including some bishops and entire annual conferences who were declaring publicly that they would refuse to follow our rules. But then after the 2019 conference, this trickle of rebellion exploded into a flood. In the older model of liberal clergy, bishops, and leaders who follow the rules even when they personally disagree is increasingly being replaced by a more militant rule-breaking sort of lib liberalism. And people across the spectrum are recognizing that this is just not sustainable. Uh, it just simply does not work to be united in a denomination of some 13 million members and dozens of annual conferences and other groups were organized into around the world if we cannot agree to follow our own rules for how to work together. It simply does not work to stay united when we are getting increasingly divided and contentious and fighting one another all the while our denomination keeps dying off in every part of this country. We can keep fighting and fighting at the next general conference and the next and the next and the next with lots of costly complaints and church trials and bad press in between until one side finally wins. But by that point, there might not be much of a denomination left to win. It's widely admitted that our disagreements over sexual morality stem from much deeper theological disagreements, such as some of the issues I mentioned earlier. So over the course of 2019, there were various quiet dialogues about how to find ways to separate into different denominations and how to do it in a way that maybe might not be completely amicable, but maybe could at least lessen some of the level of the bitterness and uh, avoid seen, in, seen elsewhere and avoid the lawsuits over property where we've seen other denominations spend tens of millions of dollars of people who used to be the same denomination suing each other over church buildings. 
So you had this group of 16 leaders from across the theological spectrum with representation from bishops, different parts of the globe, different caucus groups like confessing movement and WCA, et cetera, gay people, ethnic diversity, et cetera. And with a professional mediator, they hammered out a plan that has a lot of flaws. I'll admit that readily, but it is a compromise that they could all live with. It's called the Protocol on Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. When the General Conference is able to meet, hopefully later this year, it should be the top order of business. It does seem from looking out that liberals in the group played hardball. And so there's a lot of specific terms that are unfair. It's not what I would call a great plan or what I would come up to if it was entirely up to me. But at this point, some version of this is really the only realistic way forward. So here are the most basic terms. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that regardless of what happens with the name, the two main new denominations that are gonna emerge, each one of them is gonna be very different from the United Methodist Church as we have known it. And don't trust anybody who tries telling you otherwise. So there will be two main new denominations emerging. There will be a liberalized post-separation United Methodist Church, as people are calling it, or the PSUMC for short. And there is, then there will be a, a more evangelical, globally oriented Methodist denomination whose name is yet to be publicly released. Uh, it's, there is provision and possibility in some talk about uh, a third or additional denominations forming, but that really, frankly, doesn't seem likely at this point. Uh, then, according to the terms, the post separate the PSUMC gets to inherit, uh, and, and if, I'll just ask if people are, need to talk to their spouse or somebody in the background, if you wouldn't mind muting themselves, and I would ask my co-host for some help with that, but um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, so the post-separation UMC will get to inherit the United Methodist name, logo, trademark, all the official United Methodist agencies in Nashville and DC and Chicago and all of our seminaries, all of our official United Methodist seminaries and all of conferences, congregations and campus ministries will go into the PSUMC by default, but they can decide to join the new evangelical denomination and keep their properties unlike what is seen in the Episcopal Church or the Presbyterian Church USA. There was um, concern talk for how certain um, ministries for in Africa and for people of color in this country could be hurt by this split. And so there is $39 million as part of this deal, $39 million is set aside for Africa University in Zimbabwe and uh, which is the United Methodist University in Zimbabwe and as well as ethnic ministries in the United States through 2028. And then there is $25 million set aside for the new evangelical Methodist denomination. And there is, uh, there are some people in Africa who, you know, are understandably upset that Africans were not more included in this process and who have talked about proposing uh, some uh, three or four amendments, but these three or four amendments don't really change the fundamental nature of these terms. Perhaps the most significant of those four amendments is that uh, uh, some Africans are asking for um, there to be a provision that all denominations that emerge from the split would still be allowed to use some version of the United Methodist name and uh, iconic cross and flame logo. So if you wanted to continue with more Orthodox people still in the United Methodist Church and you wanted to um, you know, continue into the denomination for Orthodox United Methodists, how do you do it? Uh, it's important to understand sitting back and waiting will, and being passive will not do anything. It is the burden is on traditionalists to be more, uh, to take the initiative. So an entire annual conference can go to, can go with the more Orthodox Methodist denomination and you can have a resolution submitted to your, your annual conference, just like uh, resolutions would be submitted at any other annual conference session to say, hey, we want to go with the Orthodox Methodist Church. Or you can have somebody stand up on the floor and say, I want to make this motion that we uh, align with this denomination. And if at least 20% of the people in the room voting support a right for your motion to be heard, 
then you have to have a debate and you have to have a vote on that motion. And then it is not a fair and free election. The uh, part of how the hardball I was talking about from the liberal side was that they blatantly essentially, we've been heard some talk in our country about allegations of rigged election, but I can tell you this is a blatantly rigged vote that the liberals have rigged it uh, so that it is a uh, liberal negotiators appear to have rigged it so that it is a 57% vote to stay with the denomination that keeps the same standards that we currently have in the book of discipline. And so a 57% vote to stay traditionalist, then the conference will move into the new denomination and have to disassociate itself from the post-separation United Methodist Church. But if just one person over 43% vote against such a resolution, then the post-separation United Methodist Church gets to effectively take over the annual conference. And there is a deadline of about one year that's provided for in the protocol. And if there's no vote by this one year deadline uh, from the time of roughly one year from the time of the general conference to the, the end of the deadline, and if the annual conference has a chance to meet and they meet and they don't have any vote, then by default, they get taken by the post-separation United Methodist Church. And then congregations and campus ministries are treated essentially the same way. And uh, the process for them would apply either if they wanted to say, I'm not waiting on my annual conference, uh, I want to join the traditionalist denomination, or my annual conference voted to go with the more liberal denomination, I don't like it, I want to join the more conservative denomination, or this would also apply to if it's, say, an annual conference in Missouri or Western Pennsylvania or elsewhere says that they want to join the traditionalist denomination and some congregation or campus ministry can say, wait a second, we're more liberal. We don't want to follow our annual conference so that they, they can then swim back away from their annual conference to be part of the post-separation UMC all through the same process that either the church council or the administrative council of your congregation or the pastor would request a special church conference of your district superintendent. And once the request is made, the district superintendent has no right of discretion. Once the request is made, it must be held. That's a matter of right within 60 days of the request. And I would hope in any congregation doing this that they wouldn't just request the, co the, the uh, conference and then just, okay, in a couple months we'll have the conference. I hope that they would have lots of dialogue and conversation and also cleaning of their membership roles so you don't get surprised by a bunch of people you haven't seen in here showing up and skewing the vote. I hope that all of that could be taken care of before you have the big vote and the big meeting. And at the meeting, you would have anybody who is a member in good standing of the campus ministry or congregation would get to vote at the church conference on which way to go. And the church council would get to decide in advance whether it would take a two-thirds uh, or a simple majority. I'm sorry, I have a typo. I said two-thirds of simple majority. I meant to say two-thirds or simple majority vote to uh, go for a different direction than your, go with a different denomination than the rest of your annual conference. And something that's very important and different from the split scene elsewhere is that there are no, you would not have to pay as a congregation any kind of or an annual conference, any kind of immediate exit fee uh, for joining the new denomination. If a congregation decided, I don't want to join with any other denomination, I just want to go independent, then you would have to pay some things up front, and I would not recommend that. But there would be no exit fee on lawsuits or anything to have to, uh, to get to leave. You would have the, the right to make the switch as a congregation. So trajectories uh, for the future, there is, um, you know, I can be, I want to be a little cautious here because this is necessarily uh, speculative, but I think uh, we can be clear that the more evangelical Methodist denomination, you're no longer going to have to worry about having bishops who deny the resurrection or teach that Jesus Christ was a bigot. And there are lots of clear indications, very clear, specific, concrete indications we have with the post-separation United Methodist Church on what some more specific trajectories are likely to be like in the first few years after the split on issues uh, besides just uh, sexuality. And uh, I was at a big meeting in Atlanta uh, nearly a year ago where we had uh, bishops from around the world, uh, traditionalist conservative bishops from around the world, 
leaders of renewal groups like myself and leaders of prominent pastors who had not been previously associated with for renewal groups. And we all together came up with a common vision for what we wanted this new evangelical Methodist denomination to be like. And some of the things were clear was that we wanted a renewed culture of accountability for our leadership and faithfulness to what are the present doctrinal and moral standards of the United Methodist Church, which we are not observing in a lot of the United Methodist Church today, that this new denomination is gonna have a very global orientation and this, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things of why do they get to keep all the agencies uh, on the more liberal side? Well, we have about, depending on how you count them, 13 or 14 large agencies and bureaucracies that uh, are largely already dominated by liberal American factions. And there's going to be need to, to have some structure in any big denomination, but there's also a commitment to have a much smaller and less costly bureaucracy. And the post-separation United Methodist Church, uh, as we've seen in other denominations that have changed their standards on marriage uh, and ordination related to sexuality, uh, that we will see increasingly dramatic liberalization over time, that it won't be they'll change just on this one issue and everything else will stay the same. We'll see lots of more theological liberalization on a number of other issues. Uh, but one thing that will make the liberalization of the post-separation UMC much more dramatic than what's seen in the Episcopal Church and the Presbyterian Church USA is that in those other denominations, you're still able to have a bit of a evangelical conservative subculture in some places because each congregation essentially gets to decide who its pastor is. But in our discipline, in our constitution, uh, bishops have a nearly absolute right to send congregations whoever they want. So there would be no right in the post separation United Methodist Church for any congregation, at least in the United States, to refuse to have a partnered gay pastor. If they did not believe that was faithful and didn't want to have such a pastor, too bad if the bishop sends that to you. And there could be some real potential for pastors to face retaliation in the post-separation UMC, and I would even say a likelihood to face some kind of retaliation uh, if they do not perform same-sex weddings as pastors, if they refuse to because they don't believe in that. Uh, and also, there, those who expect to be leaders in the, the post-separation United Methodist Church have been very loud and clear in repeatedly saying that they would insist on the new or in the post-separation United Methodist Church having a much more segregated governance for the United States and the global region, saying they don't like this business of we have a general conference where you have delegates from the Philippines and Eastern Europe and Africa and America all getting together to decide on what are our common moral standards on matters like marriage and sexual morality. They want to have a much more segregated governance where the USA and different regions would essentially uh, go their own way. So we have lots of important choices ahead of all of us, but and there's lots more detail I could say about any of this. But again, in talking with Jan, I'm first giving you all a big picture overview and then uh, happy to see what kind of questions you have and what's uh, more of interest to you. 